Hello, so um, welcome back. I turned on the screencast. That's done. Um, first question, have you, is 480.sagemb.org working better during the last two days than it was before? Okay, good. It doesn't have to share any resources with sagemb.org, and sagemb.org usually has hundreds of users whereas at the same time, whereas 480 has you know only 15 or 20. Okay, good. Um, Let's see, reminder, homework number three is due tonight at midnight. So I'm just reminding you of that. Um, let me bring it up on the screen quickly to see if there are any quick questions about it. I've, of course, received uh, many, many, many questions about the homework in email, most of which I've answered with a CC to the list. Um, but remember, question one was to make a patch. And I went over an example of doing that in quickly once in class on Monday, then I think in great detail on Friday as a screencast, etc. Um, the second one is to give three tickets that in a perfect world you could address and how you would address them. And the third is to write further information about your project. I think maybe a third of the people in class have already turned in the homework assignment, but um, for the other people, turn it in by midnight tonight. But before that, are there any quick questions that you want to ask? about the homework. Yes, you know, Andre. After, after, we, after we have done the patch and we have finished everything, where, to, where actually to get, to get this patch? So, um, and what direction? It depends on where you made the patch. OK? So what you do is, it. I mean, it's, I think it says in that file that I posted, um, in the step-by-step -step directions. Browser. Yeah, you use your browser and you go sage.math. Um, where is it? Just in your web browser, you type sage.math, Washington, edu, um, sage.math.washington.edu, home, math 480. And you'll get a directory listing. One of them is Scratch. And then there's one directory for each person. For example, your ANSA 1989. You click there, you'll find a directory Sage. And inside of there, you'll find uh, Devel, Sage, Sage, um, yours is probably in the probability directory. Yes, yes, okay, yes. Yeah. I, think, yes, yes. I think it depends and there it is. where you ran. Yeah. That's you your ran patch. The HG. Okay. Yeah, it's exactly where you ran your hg command. Okay, so the answer is right there. Okay, um, the next thing on our to do list for today is to discuss the next homework assignment, which I've posted now. This one is due in one week. Let me go over it. All right, so there are um, let's zoom a little more. So there are three problems. The first problem is very similar to the thing that I went over in class repeatedly. You're going to write two f versions of a function that do something. This is going to compute the sum of the squares of the first n integers and return the result. You'll write one version in Python and another one in Cython, and the one in Cython should explicitly declare the types of the um, variables that you use in the function. You can assume that any input will be at most 1 million. And finally, you'll just compare the timings of the two functions, the Python version and the Cython version, for input equal to 1 million. OK? So that's it. That's the first problem. So it's kind of like just one example of what we did a lot in class during the week. Um, this one, for some people, you'll find that the Cython version is incredibly fast because of your optimizing compiler. And for other people, you might not find that. Um, it depends on where you actually do the assignment. A second thing is that if you've installed Sage on your own computer, and for some strange reason your computer doesn't have any compiler at all, for example, a kind of default uh, OS X install won't have any compiler unless you install Xcode, then um, you won't be able to use percent Cython at all. Um, Linux distributions typically by default come with a compiler. They always, they, like any recent version of Ubuntu just comes with GCC. So if you're using Linux and have installed Sage yourself, it should be fine. Um, I believe that the Sage Virtual Machine for Windows also has a compiler included in it. Um, but OS X, if you don't install Xcode, then you won't have it. Xcode, I think, comes with your computer, but on a separate DVD. 
Um, of course, you can always just use 480.sagemb.org, which should have a Cython compiler in it. I mean, it should have a compiler. Cython should work fine there. Okay, so that's problem one. Problem two is very similar to something I showed you on uh, Wednesday, which is find a closed form expression for sum k equals 1 to n cosine of k. And all you have to do is use the sum command. I did exactly this problem with sine. If you just literally change, like, I guess, three letters in the example I gave on Wednesday, <laughs> you'll get the answer for this. That said, um, and I'm kind of curious, uh, if you know how to do this without using Sage by math, um, I wouldn't mind seeing a solution like that, since I don't know how to do that. Um, so somebody can think of a way to find that. I think it's usually you just multiply by sine one half and then get a telescopic sum. Cool. Yeah, do it. Also do or, like, or is it IN sum? It's a geometric sum. Yeah. That's that. a good idea. Yeah. Nice. So in addition to two for extra fun, um, you only need to just evaluate it in Sage to get full credit. But if you want to actually deduce this using either this identity you mentioned or that identity you mentioned and telescoping sums, that would be nice as well. But you don't have to do that for credit. OK? Um, and I guess the third thing, would, if you do do that, would be to check that the result you get actually agrees with what Sage gets. right? So you'd have to type in whatever you got and make sure that it's equal to what Sage gets. Um, OK, and then problem three is the following. So in the assignment that you turned in a week ago, homework assignment two, you created eight functions that had various inputs and outputs. All you're going to do is take those functions and put them in a new Sage worksheet and put percent Cython before each one and see what happens. For each one, you'll see how much it speeds up on some input of your choice, and you'll also see whether or not it compiles at all. Okay, so that's the problem. Um, the only thing I want you to do to modify the functions is if there's some, if you explicitly called a function like Fibonacci number or something like that, or whatever it's called in Sage, and your function doesn't compile be, when you put percent scythe in there, you should put from sage.all import Fibonacci, whatever. That's the only thing you should need to do to change things. If you're curious, of course, you can add some type declarations and so on, but you don't have to do that for this problem. I'm guessing that many of the functions will speed up by a factor of about 30%, but we'll see. Okay, and that's the entire homework assignment. All right. Any questions about this? Okay. All right, next. Um, let's see. Uh, Topic-wise, the rest of the quarter after today is going to be about specific mathematical topics instead of general um, Python, Cython, Sage development type topics. And um, I think what I'll start next week is, or I think what I'll talk about next week is linear algebra, and then I think the week after that will be number theory, and then um, symbolic calculus and statistics. But I reserve the right to possibly permute these. Definitely the week after next week will be number theory, because I'll be in San Diego, and one of the number theory postdocs, who is also an active Sage, very active Sage developer, will be um, talking for that week. And so um, he wants to talk about number theory. Okay, midterm, um, I'll give the midterm next Wednesday, and it'll be due on Friday. It's take home, so don't worry about doing it in class. I'm going to try to make it short because I want it to be easy for me to grade, and I want it to be easy for you to do. Um, I imagine it will take you less than two hours when you just sit down and do it. Um, hopefully, I mean, less than two hours. It should be kind of like one and a half of the problems on a homework assignment. Okay, so that will happen, and uh, that will be next Wednesday. Is that okay? Right. Um, I don't want it to be, it's not going to be like, you know, three homework assignments all due in two days or something like that. It should be pretty short. Okay. And then finally, today what we'll do is uh, finish talking about Cython. And instead of kind of doing one big example, for today what I'm going to do is list what the most important features are of the Cython language, all of which you've seen examples of during the last few days. And then we're going to focus on, of those features, which is the most important feature amongst those, which is declaring types. And then I'll show you um, the syntax for declaring types, and I'll show you some examples that illustrate each of the different ways in which you can declare types and what some of the subtleties are. Okay? And then the other um, parts of Cython I'm not going to go over, though you've seen examples of them. Uh, if you want to look at them, you can look at the textbook for the class, which does discuss each of them, or you can, or I should say, and you should look at the Cython documentation itself. Okay? All right, so the main features of the language 
um, of Cython that really go beyond what you can do in Python is um, you can declare and use variables that have data types. So you have static typing for variables, unlike in Python. Um, there is explicit typecasting, so you can change variables from one type to another, just like in C. You can um, declare external data types and functions to use within your Cython code. An example of that was declaring the sign function so we could use it. We said it took as input a double and gave back a double. Um, but you can also declare data types. For example, there are C structs and other things like that that you can declare and use or type this. Um, you can define functions. We did a bunch of that before where we defined functions to compute the sum of the first sign, the signs of the first n integers. And you can also define Cython classes. We did that on Wednesday. We gave an example where we defined a Cython class that represented a vector of doubles. Okay. For today, we're going to talk in detail just about number one, which is declaring and using CDEFT variables. It's probably the most important of all the things you need to know about, and uh, it's pretty useful in that you can take existing Python code, put percent Cython at the top, and just by declaring variables, you can get a lot of speed up. So that's like the core thing that you really need to know about. There are other things you can do, but this is the most critical one. Okay. All right, so um, for declaring using CDEF variables, this is what the um, notation looks like. And we'll just copy it over here. What you do is you write CDEF, then you give a um, data type, so the name of a type, and then you give the name of a variable. So it's kind of like in C, except in C you wouldn't put CDEF. You just put type name variable and have a semicolon to terminate statement. Um, you can actually give several variable names if you want to declare multiple variables to have that type. Something I didn't mention in the slide, if you want to make a pointer, then you have to put a star in front of the variable name. That makes a pointer to something of that type. So that's it. Um, but the main thing is, what are the possibilities for the type name? Also, there's a little more to the notation. You can give um, cdef type name variable name one equals something. You can give it an initialization of the variable right there when you declare it. Um, but you don't have to. I didn't mention it there. But you can also do equals something. Some expression. You can stick that in there if you want. Okay, so various examples of what can go where you put type name are the following. You can put C data types. Some examples of C data types are int, long, and double. And there are also um, modifiers you can put, like short int, long int, sign int, unsigned int, etc. Any type name that would that you would find in, in the standard C language, and you can find many books and tutorials about C, since it's one of C and C++ together, perhaps the... Um, most popular language is out there. So they're very comparable in popularity to Java and other languages, but maybe they're the most popular. Because um, a lot of stuff is written in C. So you know, if you look up in any reference on C and find standard data types, you can use them there. Um, you can use certain Python types, like list, dict, stir, object, and so on. And I'll show you some examples of this in a moment. So for example, you can declare a variable to be a Python list. And then when you try to assign to that variable, if you try to assign something that isn't a Python list, you'll get an error message. Um, also, in the Cython code, when it accesses entries of that variable, it will use a faster method to get at them than it would if it didn't know that it was a Python list. So if in your code you write something like v square back it's 4, the fact that you declared it to be a Python list means that that, will, that access will be ever so slightly faster than if you didn't declare it to be a Python list. So it gives the compiler extra information and allows you to do some type checking. Um, you can give the name of a CDEF class. For example, that vector of doubles thing that we did on Wednesday, that was a CDEF class. There are many CDEF classes in Sage. Integer, for a Sage integer, that class with a capital I, that's an example of a CDEF class. And I'll show you how to use that as a type name in a moment in one of the examples. You can also give more complicated data types. Um, like 
that you would find in various C libraries out there, like structs and C++ classes and type defs and so on. I'm not going to show any examples of that today, but um, in practice it can be enormously useful. If you're trying to implement a um, new type of number and you want it to be very fast, you might actually just implement the entire thing in C++ and benchmark it there. It might be something you can just do at a low level in C++ very efficiently. And then what you can do is you can write a little bit of Cython code to make it so it's easy to use that C++ code from within Cython. And then you would end up um, using this sort of capability. So that, that in fact is how a lot of the fast code in Sage is written. Um, usually what happens is the C++ code is written by some um, other person. For example, there's some French people that wrote a library called Javaro and it implements a lot of finite field arithmetic and so on in C++, and we just use that in Sage directly. And it uh, gives us really fast finite field arithmetic. Okay, so now I'm going to show you examples mainly of the first four of these. Uh, no, the first three of these, because there are only four. Okay, first, here's a block of code, and this just gives examples of declaring a whole bunch of different types of uh, variables, and in each case here, I've initialized the variable as well, and then I just print them all out. Yes? Do you have to uh, set your your data types at the very beginning? Can you set up the types and storage? You can put them, um, that's a very good question, what's the scoping of the variables? Um, you can put them at, you can't put them nested inside of other things inside of the, well, let's see, you can't nest them, say, inside of a for loop or something like that, um, but you can put them anywhere in the code, almost. So, um, so his questions, uh, so in, in, for example, in standard C, you're supposed to put all the declarations at the top, or maybe you're forced to put them at the top, whereas in C++, you can put declarations all over the place and use braces to do scoping and, and so on. Um, in Cython, you don't have to put them all at the top, but there are certain places where you can't put them. So for example, if I put a for loop here, uh, uh -oh. what's wrong? Whoa! <laughs> That's scary. No, it's kind of fun. Okay. Aww. It's a for loop. <laughs> wow. Okay, so this could be tricky. I may have to... It may do that for a second. Okay, good. So if I, I can't do this, this is this will give us an error. cdef int i. Or not i. Uh, what's your name? Who asked the question? Austin. Austin. Okay, cdef Austin. So, um, first, there's no error because I haven't declared i. You don't have to declare every variable you use, um, obviously, because you're supposed to be able to take Python code and just run it with percent Cython, which means that by default you don't have to declare a variable. But this will give an error. I think it'll say cdef statement not allowed here. So there are some places where cdef statements are not allowed. However, Cython does have closures, so um, that means that you can do something like this: def f of n. Uh, no, let me not call it n. Uh, def f of Austin. Um, cdef int powers return, uh, let's say powers equals austin times austin return powers. Um, print f of 10. So that's a nested function, which is something that um, is available in Cython now. It wasn't in Pyrex, and it's one of the main language features that was added by um, Robert Bradshaw and Craig Citro, who were to um, post or students slash postdocs that we have here. And um, let's just run this to see it work. Notice that here we have this nested function, and F is calling it. And in fact, it has its own scope. It inherits the scope that it's in, but it also has variables that are local just to that function and can't be seen outside of that function. It's an extremely powerful construct being able to do this. Uh, it's really, really nice that, that Cython can now do this. Um, so there you are. Okay, so um, Sarah's question is, I used def right here instead of cdef to declare this function. I think that's your question. So um, first, this is a function rather than a variable. If I were declaring a variable, I'd have to use cdef. Um, the second reason is the following. If I declare this to be a cdef function, and there is such a thing as cdef functions, then it's only callable from other Cython code in that same block, okay? In particular, I won't be able to call it once I've defined it. Um, 
So I can compile, oh, another reason. Apparently closures are not in, allowed inside of CDEFT functions. So that would be a reason not to do this. Um, but let's just say I get rid of that by doing control hash. Then um, this might work, but it will be the old version of the function. Yeah. So notice it still prints out 100. So when I evaluated this code again, it just doesn't make that available at all. Though if I wanted to call this function from other Cython code in the same block, it would be faster to call it than it is if it's a deft function. So when you define a cdeft function instead of a deft function, it can be called much, much more quickly from other Cython code, but unfortunately it can't be called from outside. This seems kind of silly. It should be that it could still call it outside with a little bit of a penalty. So um, Robert Bradshaw wrote some code about three years ago that fixes this and that you can type cpdef, and that allows that generates both versions of the function. It makes a function that can be called from outside with um, a little bit of a penalty, but it's still very fast if you call it from within the same um, block. And there you are. And that um, now is using the new version. Sarah. Yeah. So behind the scenes, so Sarah's question is, what the heck do I mean by a block? Um, I mean one of these percent Cython cells. What happens behind the scenes when you hit Shift Enter in one of these cells is that it creates the C file, it compiles this C file to a shared object library. It then dynamically links in that shared object library to the running copy of Sage. And if you do this with another percent Cython cell, it makes an entirely separate shared object library or a dynamic link library if you're a more Windowsy person and links that one in and they're completely separate. So that's what I mean by one block. And um, it's somewhat, you have to do a little bit of work if you want to call code between different cells. Um, if they have a Python interface that you can call them from Python, then of course you can call them between different cells. If you're writing your own separate Cython code in files, I'll get to your question in a second, then um, it's pretty clean to have stuff get called between different files. There's a protocol for how that works. Um, but yeah, behind the scenes it's doing many subtle and interesting and powerful things in that it's compiling code, taking that compiled code and linking it into your program at runtime. So it results in, you know, it's powerful and fast, but it's complicated, unfortunately. Ben. Uh, so, you could then do like CDEF for the F of offering, right? Mm, I don't know. I'll find out. Um, first, uh, how do I uncover? Oh, here it is. Okay, so first let me change this back. I don't know whether cpdef allows a closure or a nested function. Nope, not allowed to do that. Surprised it gives an internal error. That looks bad. I think I just found a bug in Cython. It gave an internal error when I. Did you see that? I found a bug in Cython. Cool. So just for fun, I found a bug in Cython. <laughs> Robert Bradshaw and I are meeting for a coding sprint tonight at 10, so I'll be happy to show him this bug in Cython. Uh, internal compiler error. You're never supposed to see internal compiler error. Although you'll see it all the time if you do a lot of programming, but that always means there's a bug in the compiler. Anything that, in any situation, any compiler should never say internal compiler error. You're not supposed to have code that can do that. Um, but obviously I did. <laughs> so that's a bug in Cython. Um, bug in Cython. Right, so back to our story. Um, you asked if I can make this a cdeft function, and I don't know. Um, about to find out. Apparently, no. Can I make it a cpdeft function? Probably not. Nope. It has to be a deft function. So that you can do, but you can't do cpdef or cdeft functions currently nested inside of other functions. Yes, then that's perfectly fine. Yep. So just to illustrate that, we can take this and take it out, put it up here, go like that, make it a cdeft function, and then call it just like this. Okay? And let's see if we see 100 when we run this. Yep, it works. Moreover, um, I can actually pass in and return c data types to a cdeft function. This is something you can't do with deft functions. Deft functions are normal Python functions, 
you can pass in stuff and it gets converted to a C data type, but you can't um, return a C level data type. So if we look at the auto generated code for F, we'll find that it just gets turned into a normal C function that takes as input and int and returns an int. To prove that to you, let's look at the auto generated code. And notice it's very white, there's no yellow anywhere in sight, meaning that it didn't get transformed very much. And here's the corresponding code. It's really just a very long function name that takes as input and int. And at the bottom when it returns, it's just, uh, let me be, right here, it just, somewhere in here it returns, right there, it's just returning the number. So it's not doing very much. And also this function call, um, calling the function, it just, it calls the function by just plugging in 10. And then it has to do a lot of work because I put the print in. The print part has to turn that object into a Python object so that it can call the Python print function to actually display it. Questions? Yes? Yes, that's correct. So right here is an example. Yeah, so what, so what that line does is it says that there's a character, there's a pointer of type character. Yes. Which points to the string. Well, there's a, actually, what this line does is declares s to be a variable that is a pointer to an array, uh, or it's a pointer to a character. So it's a pointer. s itself is a pointer. So it'll be like a 64-bit number that holds a memory location. The memory location it's pointing at is a character. And the convention in the C language is that the way strings are represented is they're a contiguous array of characters in memory terminated by a null character, like a zero. So what happens when the compiler sees this is it will allocate some memory. It'll put these, it'll put like 97, and then whatever space is in ASCII, I guess 32, 97, 32, 68, etc. It'll put those numbers in a row in memory, and then it'll put a zero at the end. And this S is, a, is literally like that memory address. So how is that? How is that different than the line before it? I mean, isn't that C like just a pointer? Nope. So the line before this C will be an actual here. It's it's not a pointer. It is um, a variable that, or what it, I mean, it's just a, it's just a, um, it's not a pointer to anything. It's just the letter C. So. Um, yeah. So Cython knows, so you might think that when you, if you're using um, the C language and you try to print S as an integer or something, it would probably just give you the location of the pointer, the location that the pointer's pointing out. But Cython knows, it has a rule that says, oh, if you're trying to print a char star, actually look it up the corresponding string and try to print that. Whereas here, it says, oh, it's a char. Figure out what that character is and print that. Okay, if so you want to use like the C printing instead, you have to use the printf function defined in C. And then you can get more fun stuff. Um, I'm not sure if this will work or not, but we'll see. I have no idea what will happen here. Uh, let me do this. Okay, it looks like, I think what happens is it doesn't capture the output unless I, if I do this, I have to do this in uh, the command line to see the output in printf, I think, um, unfortunately. I might be able to turn s into an int, and then I, I think if I do that, I don't even know. Uh, no, you can't do that. Oh, ah, oh, you're right. I didn't put a new line in. Ha ha ha. There. Now it'll be clear what happens. There you are. Ha. <laughs> See, that's a pointer. So that is the location in memory where that S, where this string is. And then C is just is literally just in memory. You put a character C. And there's no pointer anywhere involved in that. I mean, there is a location in memory where C is. If you want to find out what that is, you'd have to use ampersand, which gives you the address of something in memory, like that. So, and I think you can do the same in Cython. Yes. So ampersand, before a, a C level variable, that's how in C you get the address of a variable. Okay. Is that good? Did I answer your question? All right. Other questions about this?
I mean, it, it's obvious that if you want to really, really be good at writing Cython code, you need to do, learn the basics of the C language, despite it looking completely different from um, Cython. Uh, not completely different, but somewhat different. Uh, but generally speaking, if you want to use a computer well, then it's a really good idea to learn the basics of the C language, because that, I mean, C really closely models how computers actually work. Um, the data types in C map closely to the data types that computers have, uh, etc. There's not much abstraction between C and your computer. I mean, there is in some sense, but not as much as between Python and your computer. Okay, here's another example. Moving on. In this example, I've uh, made a function that takes two Python variables as input, and I declared two variables, and I want them to have types list and dict. And then I tried to do assignments. And what will happen is if the um, if x is not a list, or if y is not a dictionary, I'll get a runtime error when it tries to do that assignment. That is, we have type checking. So here when I pass in a list and a dict, the type checking happens. Here it also happens, but it says, hey, you gave me an integer, I expected a list. So you get an error at runtime. It's not at compile time, because it doesn't know what you're going to feed in. Um, has an, I mean, wouldn't even make sense. But at runtime, you get an error. Can't do that conversion. We can also, and here's another example of that, where I put, I make the second argument not a dictionary. You can also declare the types of x and y if you want to be something. So it's kind of related but simpler example would be to do this uh, list of x and dictionary of e. We also have it print x and y. So if I do type example 2, if I give it a list and a dictionary, it'll work fine. But if I give it anything else, say I make the first one the number 17, then it doesn't work. Okay? So in Cython, you can, you can say, I want the input types to be the following. And you can give them. And, uh, and the advantage to doing that is, of course, you're, you're guaranteed that x is a list. And then certain operations such as x square brackets 2 should be a little bit faster. Okay. Um, not exactly. There is the answer is yes and no. Um, I guess the answer is yes. <laughs> um, in Sage, there is something that's called that's a vector over the integers, and in fact, there is a Cython type behind the scenes, and you could it would be very reasonable to think of that as a list of integers in the sense that it's exactly the same as a list of integers, um, except it's not exactly the same. It's really a vector of integers, so you can't append to it. It has a fixed number of entries. So the answer is sort of yes and no. Um, so here, if you're literally using a Python list, there's no way to ensure that the entries in the Python list all have the same data type. You can't do that from Cython. Um, but if you want to somehow represent something that corresponds to a vector of integers where the number of entries in the vector is fixed, then there is a data type for that, um, which you'd have to kind of dig up in the Sage source code. Just to give you an example of that object, though, if I do zz, say, 5, if I go uh, a equals that, or couple a equals that, that constructs an object, which is the ambient free module of rank 5 over the principal ideal domain integer. As you can see, the description is aimed at graduate students um, because all the graduate students in here are probably happy hearing words like ambient free mod or at least free module and principal ideal domain. Undergrads might not be so happy with principal ideal domains and stuff in the output, and engineers aren't ever happy with that. Um, but if you make an, an entry in here or an element of this, seven, do that. That's a specific. Um, element of this free module of rank 5 and it has a type which is uh, sage modules vector integer dense vector integer dense so that data type right there you could um, you could specify a that is the input to a Cython function I think let me see if I can actually do that you have to do something you have to say from that module um, C import 
Oh, sorry. From this module, C import vector integer dense. Hope this works. And then you could do f f of v, but you want v to be a vector integer dense. And then you might say print. Um, I don't know what's something you could do with a vector. T dot hub. I can. I think what to do with a vector. Maybe I can do the dot product with itself. How's that? Um, what was I? Oh, so print v dot v. Okay, so I defined my function. I could do f of t, and it, oh, there's no dot product. Maybe it's called dot product. There it is. See, but if I try to call f with something else that's not a vector integer dense. For example, with a list, 4, 5, 6, minus 3, 7, it's going to give me an error message. Okay, it says type error, argument has incorrect type. So in a sense that partly answers your question, um, but it doesn't completely answer it. It turns out, by the way, if you look at the source code for vector integer dense, then you'll find that if you declare something this way, then you can get access to the underlying, um, turns out it's a list of MPI, MPIR integers, so arbitrary precision integers. There's a uh, pointer to an array in memory, um, to a contiguous list in memory of integers, and by declaring the variable v this way, you can get direct access to that and start um, applying functions in the MPIR library to the entries in the vector v. And this allows you to uh, very, very quickly modify v, or write other functions on v that maybe weren't implemented. So for example, if you wanted a function that summed up all the entries in v, you could write one um, that would be as fast as anything you'd write in C. Um, once you've declared the type of the variable, then you have access to its internal structure. Okay, I'm going to show you an example like that in a moment, but with uh, integer instead of vector integer dense. Um, and note the obvious question is how do I know to look in this module? But again, that was I made a vector over the integers and then I typed type of it, and that gave this back. And C import, that's another keyword I've, I don't think I've mentioned at all before. Um, it's like the Python import command, but it lets you, it's a Python version of that that lets you get, um, it lets you import sort of the secret Cython information that isn't available at the Python level about an object. That's what C import allows you to do. I'm just trying to give you a taste and a flavor for uh, what Cython's capable of without giving you every detail. And you, if you really want to make good use of it, you really want to sit down and you know, work through the Cython tutorial and so on. Um, okay, so moving on. Here is an example um, which just illustrates making up your own class and then using that as the type. Um, this is really pretty similar to what we just did a second ago, so I'll skip it. Uh, now for a tariff, actually, let me not quite skip it. Um, I'll evaluate this. This is just like what we did a minute ago, except instead of vector integer dense, I just made up a new little tiny class. Other than that, this is exactly like what we were just doing. Um, now, I want to show you a very, very terrifying caveat. This is something to watch out for. If you type, if you give none as the input to any of these functions that are supposed to take some um, Cython class as input, they'll still accept it by default but they'll set that variable equal to none. And this can lead to seg faults very quickly. Just as an example, let's go back up here. Remember we were uh, sort of convinced that f would only work if it had something that was of type vector integer dense. Not quite true. If you give it none as input, it also um, works in the sense that it allowed that through. It set v equal to that. And now v is none, and it tries to call dot product on none. This would be very bad if you tried to call, or if you tried to access um, data in v. So behind the scenes, v is again represented by this array of integers that are defined in some large integer library. And if v is equal to none, and you try to access that underlying memory, you'll instantly get a segmentation fault. I feel like my example isn't clear enough. Let me um, change this function so that it actually accesses the underlying memory and prints, say, the, the first entry of the vector. Um, like that. Okay, so t was this vector up here, which started with a 4. So this should print out 4. Now if I put in none, there's no, there's no, for, there's no zeroth entry. So something, okay, so here it's, it's literally just treating as none, so that's not so bad. Uh, I really want to 
hit this home though, and I have totally failed to hit this home. So let's see, what can I do? I'm going to have to look at the source code for vector integer dense and see what the underlying memory is called, and then I'll get at it, and then I'll do something with it. Okay? So I'm going to find the source code for vector integer dense. Um, there are many ways to get at the source code of Sage. You can look in the Sage tarball that you had extracted for your homework assignment. Everybody knows how to do that. In fact, I think I'll do that right now for this. Well, actually, no, I want to show you another way just for fun. Um, another way you can look at the Sage source code is you can go to sagemath.org, and there's a little link that says open source. It says that Sage is open source. As proof that Sage is open source, when you click on it, it shows you the source code of Sage, or at least of the core Sage library. And it's actually a browsable repository. If you, you can look at all the changes that have been made to Sage and um, push to the repository. You can click on Browse and browse the files that are in Sage. These are in the latest released version. And uh, vector integer dense, that was in modules, vector integer dense. So here are the files. And a cool thing about this, by the way, is when you click on the file, it'll show you the source code, but you can also um, click on annotate, and it will tell you which patch to the Sage library last changed the given line of code. You can also click on file log and see which patches affected the file and when. You can do that for any file at all. So like, if you want to know who's been mucking around with vector integer dense lately, you can click on file log, and you'll see that 21 months ago, the very last change was made to that file by somebody named Martin Albrecht. And you can click on here and see exactly what they changed. Or you can, um, you can click on annotate and you can see, oh, I found a bug somewhere in here. Who introduced that bug? And you can click and see who did it and what patch introduced it. In office hours, we found a ticket like that. Or we found a, a bug in the graph. Uh, coloring code, and we were able to see that somebody, who remained nameless, uh, not me, had introduced the bug like two years ago. Okay, so going back to vector integer dense, there are two files actually, there's a px, this is really little, let me zoom in, there are two files related to vector integer dense, and one's called pxd and the other one's called .pyx. The pxd file is like a .h file in C or C++, it's like a header file that declares the um, basic layout of the data structure at the site down level, the PXY file implements everything. So let's look at the PXD file. It tells us that a vector integer dense has um, a CDEFT attribute, which is a pointer to an MPZ underscore T. So you should think of this as an array, in the sense of a C array, of MPZ underscore Ts. It turns out MPZ underscore T, this is a data type that's defined in the MPIR library, which is an arbitrary precision library. M-P-I-R. This stands for um, multi-precision integers and rationals. Multi-precision integers and rationals. It's a library for doing arithmetic with arbitrary precision integers and rationals, meaning that they can be they can have millions and millions of digits. You have two million digit integers and you want to multiply them together, this library, in some cases, will be the fastest possible library in the world for doing that. It, um, there's a related library, NPR is a fork of a library called GMP, which stands for the GNU Multi Precision Library. Um, NPIR, I made up the name because I like it. And by the way, you can, you can pronounce it Empire. Empire, <laughs> like the Empire Strikes Back. Okay. But it's also a a sensible name because it kind of suggests what it is. It's a library for multi-precision integers and rationals. And there are several other libraries with similar names, like MPFI, it's multi-precision floating point intervals. There's MPC for multi-precision complex numbers, MPFR for multi-precision floating point real numbers, etc. Uh, if you're going to do really serious programming with arbitrary precision arithmetic, then it's important to know and learn about each of these libraries. And they're all included in Sage. So that's what MPIR is, or Empire. And um, in order to illustrate what bad things could happen, let's get at this underscore entries entry right here. So v dot underscore entries square bracket zero. Um, I want to print it. It's actually a 
uh, pointer or something. I don't know if this will if this is allowed to print. Um, it should just print some like random looking thing. Okay, so I can't do that. But what we can do is the following: from sage dot rings dot integer c import integer. Then we can do c def integer n equals integer so zero n dot uh, mpz underscore set n dot underscore value I think to v dot underscore entry zero. So basically, we're going to set n to be equal to whatever the first entry is. Print n. I'm not sure that that's underscore value. I need to look. Um, I have it in an example right here, so I have to look this up. This no, there's no underscore there. Okay, so let me explain this code. Before I explain it, maybe I'll test that it actually works. Um, so what this should do is it should get the first entry of the vector and print it. And I think that it did it correctly. Um, the first entry is 4, and indeed it printed it right here, right? Uh, first entry equals. Now, there are some things to um, point out here. This is, it's getting access to this array. Um, it's completely circumventing any safety checks at all. If the vector had, is a vector of length, if it has zero entries in it, then this would immediately crash in horrible ways. Or if v were equal to none, it would also crash horribly. So let me illustrate that. Um, it's going to hurt a little. Just hang on. This should crash. Boom. Unhandled segment, sig seg v. A segmentation fault occurred. Basically, we tried to pretend like some memory that made absolutely no sense actually had an MPIR integer in it. Okay? And now my program's completely crashed, but um, the way the notebook works is when it crashes, if you just start using it again, it, um, it'll just sort of reinitialize itself, um, except none of the variables that we had from before are defined anymore. Okay? Now, the way to make sure that somebody doesn't call your function with none as input is all you do is just put is not none right here. If you do that, then it will, what? Uh, oh no, you just write not none, sorry. You put not none right there. And now, it'll work just as before, but it'll do a little tiny check to make sure the thing isn't none. And if it's none, it'll give you a type error. Uh, right there, type error. Oops, type error. All right, so the lesson is that if you're writing Cython code and explicitly declaring types, and the types aren't C types, but they're um, Cython data types like this, then you want to do not none in most cases. There's a very slight performance penalty because as a check that your object isn't none, but at least it'll ensure that you don't start writing code using your object that will seg fault. Um, I'm sure there are many places in the Sage library where if you were to just look at where Cython variables appear and then notice that there's no not none there, you could probably construct a little example that would crash it. Um, I don't know of any in particular, but I wouldn't be surprised. It's kind of a, a scary fact that that happens that way. Okay, let's see. Do I have anything else to show you? Oh, here's one other fun thing. I have to show you this since we have like one minute left. So this is just a simple function. This should feel simple to you after what we just endured. Um, I import the integer type, and now that gives me access to the underlying C level data that defines a sage integer. In particular, I can define a function that will mutate an integer in place. And that's what I'm doing right here. Using mpc set, um, if you give integers n and m, it'll make n equal to m without actually changing. Um, it's not, it, the n will point to exactly the same Python object. And that Python object gets changed in place. So watch what happens here. I just recompiled again for no reason, but um, what happens is, let's say I make the number 15 stored at this memory location. There's a Python object which wraps this MPIR object, and it contains the number 15. Let me change that number to 2011. Now, at exactly the same memory location, you have the same number n. Notice the memory location didn't change, but now it contains the number 2011. So remember, this is the sort of thing we could not do earlier in the class. There was no way to change the actual number that's stored there. And now here's why this is seriously evil and dangerous. So you don't want to do it unless you know what you're doing. Let's make a matrix. Let's compute its determinant. Let's say we don't like that the determinant is minus 2. So the answer is cached. Every time it returns, once it's computed the determinant, it stores it in a Python, or in a, it stores it, and it keeps returning the same number. It doesn't recompute it every time. So let's just change the determinant to be 2012. We've now literally changed this number that 
everybody thinks is minus 2 to be the number 2012 by directly mutate, directly modifying it. And now that it determines 2012. Okay? So you can see the danger of being able to grab the underlying C data that defines an object and then just modify it with no constraints. Nonetheless, you're allowed to do that in Cython, and sometimes it's really useful. If you look at the rest of this worksheet, which I encourage you to do on your own, you'll see an example where you can get a big speed up in an algorithm by modifying a variable in place. Okay? All right, see you on Monday. And if you have questions about homework, I'll hang out for a few minutes in the hall and answer them. But other people do. But what's your question? Or about class? What's your question? Stop. Does Sage uh, contain an implemented uh, simulation of Brownian motion? Yes, it does actually. In one variable? One variable. Yeah, it does. I read it. Oh. Uh, but the, and what's the probability space? Is it, it's, it's, it's still finite. Um, I mean, which Brownian motion? I d it'll do like random. Let's say I just want to stop my screen recording. Yeah, it'll do random walks. Um,